So this series I was saying is really dedicated to helping you learn about the different ways to get funding, to grow the business. This first episode is with George, the founder of Tide, serial entrepreneur, and he will share his journey of how he funded his different businesses, give you all his tips. Um, my name is Valentin Hutchings. I'm part of the team here at Tide. And for those of you who don't know who we are, just a bit more information about us and our services. So we are the fastest growing online business current account provider in the UK, and we are used by over 350,000 businesses. Uh, the whole reason why we exist is to save small business owners time and money. And when it comes to their uh, business banking and really about helping them streamline all of this. Um, so today we are going to tell you more about George's, sorry, just sorry, one minute I'm having, that's how you see we are live. I was just having a small difficulty with my internet. I think I'm back on. Great. Okay. Sorry about this, everyone. So just uh, to tell you a bit more about, about Tide and the products that we have to help small business owners just before we, we move on to the actual event. Um, we have an app that is packed uh, of tools to help you, you know, just streamline your business banking, really. We have an auto categorization tool that categorizes all your transaction for you or invoice future where you can create, customize and send professional invoices from the app. Particularly relevant today, uh, we have our cash flow insight tool, which allows you to access a range of credit option to suit your business, as well as our credit builder tool, which is designed to help um, small business owner grow their credit worthiness and open up option for future business funding many other features as well, but I'll, I'll let you know a bit more about how you can, um, you know, get to know more about those features and how you can stay up to date with what we're doing at Tide later on. But without further ado, um, let's start the event with some introduction. I've told you a bit about myself. So George, please, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, hi, everyone. I was um, particularly excited to talk today because I um, Val told me the enormous number of people who signed up for this is a little different too. In the very early days, when we first launched Tide, we rented a, a shop in an underground station in London uh, for six weeks to promote um, Tide. And we used to invite um, some of Britain's leading entrepreneurs to come and give speeches in this shop. But obviously nobody knew we existed and nobody cared. So literally none of some of Britain's top entrepreneurs would talk to an audience of eight people of whom um, four at least were tied staff. So uh, uh, that was awkward. And it's quite exciting to see that things have changed a little bit since then. Um, and uh, and I'm really thrilled that so many people have joined today. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, to introduce myself, um, I am quite old. So there is potentially quite a lot to talk about, um, but I'll, I'll try and keep it fairly brief. Um, I am obviously the the founder of of Tide, um, but I'm also a, a serial entrepreneur. Um, I did my first startup in uh, in 2000 uh, when I was leaving university, and I uh, knew lots of uh, um, students because I'd, I'd done lots of things. I meant I was an unusually well connected student, and I thought it'd be quite cool if all these students could stay in touch with each other after they left. So I, I I nearly invented Facebook, but unfortunately four years before anyone had digital cameras. So it was literally impossible to work out who on campus was, was the hot one that you wanted to flirt with, which is obviously the real reason why Facebook took off in 2004. So um, that was my first little, little flirtation with, um, uh, with entrepreneurship. Um, uh, after that, I had, uh, corporate jobs for a while. Then I had another crack um, eight years later with uh, a business that used to buy and sell um, secondhand goods. Uh, it was a business called Speed Sell. It was a terrible business. If you're ever tempted to launch a retail e-commerce business buying and selling secondhand goods, I strongly recommend you don't do that for lots of reasons I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. Um, and for that business, I did raise uh, some money. Um, I raised... Uh, 
I guess, uh, something like £150,000 of other people's money, plus um, I guess I probably put in something like £50,000 of my own money. Well, the business lost every penny they ever went into it. I came out of it uh, bankrupt, but um, but I did learn a bit um, uh, through that that process. Um, I also tried to pitch for uh, for money from, um, for debt from banks as well. That, that was a, a farce uh, and, and very unsuccessful. Um, and uh, uh, after that um, all went bad, uh, I went back into doing bits and bobs of contracting um, while I funded myself for a few years, experimenting with a few ideas, and then um, ultimately uh, came up with Tide. Uh, Tide obviously um, has, has uh, been a nice win. Um, and over the Tide journey, I raised a few hundred thousand of angel um, funding. Um, Plus, uh, I personally raised uh, more than 10 million of venture capital funding. And of course, uh, since then, the, the company has raised, actually, I couldn't tell you the number off the top of my head, but it'd be, uh, I don't know if it's over 100 million of venture capital at this point, but it's certainly in the high tens if it's not over 100 million. So it's a hell of a lot. Uh, and I've watched the company uh, raise um, the amounts that I didn't raise myself because I'm, I'm still on the board of Tidal, though I haven't been CEO since uh, middle of 2018. Um, so, uh, um, the other thing I do now is I, I run an incubator um, called Can Do. If you're interested, or if my talking today is very boring and you want to check out something else, you can check out our website, teamcando.com, to find out what we do. We try and work on projects with a social purpose uh, and uh, invent um, uh, new new uh, organisations to uh, to address those those social concerns. Um, uh, and none of those projects yet have, have uh, grown big enough to justify uh, large amounts of external investment. But obviously, we still apply the same lens of an investor to uh, deciding what uh, projects that we uh, we work on when we're working on for-profit projects. Some of the projects also not for profit. Um, so uh, yes, over the years, I have raised money on lots of occasions and I'm um, very happy to tell you about it. Also delighted to talk about uh, all the times when uh, I failed to raise money, which are much, much more numerous than the times when I succeeded. Yeah, fantastic. And there is this saying, we always learn more from uh, mistakes, right? And, uh, and, and, and and bad occasions rather than the wins. Um, I'm just going to send uh, the website for uh, accessing teamcandu.com. Uh, do do go and visit it. It's, it's, it's really, really great. Um, thank you so much uh, for introducing your, yourself, George, and thank you again for, for, for being here today. Um, now, we've, we've both introduced ourselves and give a bit of background. We'd love to hear from you, um, those of you who are watching us live. So I'm just going to launch a poll right now about how long ago did you start your business? We'd love to know uh, if it's quite a new venture or if you've been a business owner uh, for quite a while. Okay, I'm seeing a few of you taking the poll. Should be on your screen. It, it'll only take a second. So yeah, great. Half of you have, no, 70% of you have, have, have participated. Fantastic. Okay, so um, if, you, one of you, if you of you want to finish to um, take the poll, that'd be great. Okay, we've got 29% uh, 29 that created the business this year, 23% in the past year, 35 almost percent in the two to five years and we have whoa 13 percent of uh you that have created the business plus 10 plus years ago so fantastic congratulations that's uh that's that's fantastic to see so many different um businesses great i think that the, the most that we have 35 percent two to five years fantastic i'm going to end the poll now thank you so much for for taking it it's great to see um so many of you joining us and with different at different stages of their of their business journey so thank you so much for for giving us a bit more information uh, about you um so from from what you were saying george and and the different uh you know fundraising that you've been doing for the different businesses it sounds like you raised money by selling shares mostly um have you also ever taken debts instead uh broadly um it, most of the time no but there have been a, a couple of exceptions so um 
I mentioned a, a very unsuccessful uh, retail e-commerce business I did, Speed Sell, which used to buy and sell secondhand goods. Um, that was between 2008 and, and 2011. And um, at that time, there was a crazy and illogical um, government backed scheme to back startups with debt issued by banks. So essentially, the government promised to banks that if they would issue you know, one or two hundred thousand pounds worth of debt to startups, then uh, the government would cover the losses of that. As you can imagine, the losses were absolutely enormous because the banks were extremely bad at working out who to lend to and they didn't care about lending sensibly because it wasn't their money anyway. Um, because ultimately it was government on the hook. So um, that scheme exists for a while. And I did try to get money um, uh, for that. But even under those circumstances, I couldn't convince uh, a big bank to, to lend to me. The reality is that uh, to get debt from big banks, um, you usually have to have a pretty stable business. And that's sort of understandable because debt is priced at, you know, um, typically a few percent and uh, the proportion of businesses that will go bust in their lifetime is a lot higher than a few percent. So um, there's, it's impossible for banks to make uh, any sort of return um, unless they're only lending to businesses that are already quite proven and stable and generating cash. Um, I did uh, fund that business, however, like lots of uh, entrepreneurs, um, I did fund it using personal debt. So I took out personal loans and um, uh, use personal credit cards. Um, it happened that previously in my career, I'd worked in the credit card industry. So I sort of knew how to, uh, to, to juggle the information I put on application forms for credit cards um, a bit more than most people know how to. And as a result, I was able to rack up an enormous amount of, of personal credit card okay. debt. Um, as a result of which, when I stopped that business, when it failed, I was uh, close to bankrupt. Um, in fact, I think I would have been fully bankrupt if I hadn't been so good at getting other credit card debt in to cover my costs at the time. Um, but that was really the only exposure to sort of debt products that I had at that time. Tide, of course, has um, taken some debt in, in more recent years, uh, but it's not actually the same debt that um, you would normally think of when you go to a big bank uh, for debt. So Tide has used something called venture debt. Um, it has the same shape as uh, regular bank debt, but it's essentially more expensive. Um, and um, it is uh, lent by organizations that are not typically banks. They are specialist venture debt lenders, which are culturally a bit closer to uh, venture capital funds, uh, but they're not buying shares. They're just issuing debt. Um, and uh, by, um, uh, I mean, Tide, Tide has never announced its profitability numbers, so I'm not going to talk about those right now. But obviously, Tide has been investing very heavily um, in its future over the years. And uh, it's, um, uh, in the past would not have been able to uh, meet the sort of sustain giving off cash uh, requirements that bank debt would have required. And so this venture debt, which is essentially a bit more expensive, was a more appropriate option for Tide. And it does have the advantage that you're not selling any shares. So uh, as long as you can pay off the venture debt um, in the year subsequently, you haven't uh, reduced the shareholders um, ownership of the business. So, uh, so I've seen that venture debt. But overwhelmingly, my fundraising experience has been in selling shares and for most businesses, which are usually you know pretty risky most of the time, that is the most realistic way to uh, to get money until such point as they are stable and profitable. Yeah, absolutely. And we we have a question that we'll get to um, during the Q and A about actually how to get funding without giving away um, shares. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I think that's 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 an interesting one. We'll we'll get to at the Q and A, and we'll also talk a bit later on about other different ways uh, you, you've used to, to, to raise money. But um, what I wanted to ask you really is that obviously you've done this quite a few times now, you're very experienced in, in fundraising for different businesses. Do you enjoy the, the process of doing this, of raising money? No, I hate it. Uh, and and so do almost every um, entrepreneur who, who gets experience of it. Um, the act of raising money is almost entirely unrelated to um, doing important stuff in your company, which is the reason why you became a founder. Um, it is it is basically just an annoying thing that you have to do, um, and it takes up a huge amount of time. Um, you get asked enormous numbers of typically pretty idiotic, uh, idiotic questions by um, uh, people who might 
give you the money. And um, of course, along the way, you have to suck up to them endlessly um, because uh, you know they're the ones with the power typically, and and, and you're not. Um, and you get rejected, um, you know, almost always. I mean, even um, the the best most exciting businesses for investors would expect uh, to be rejected at the end of most of their investment pitches. Uh, and I don't think I'm telling tales out of school to say that that has been true for Tide throughout its entire history, even Tide. Um, so it, that is, you know, the standard and just about nobody in, in just about any circumstances uh, avoids endless rejection. The only, as I see it, really sort of good and useful part of the process, apart from the fact that you get a lot of money at the end of it that hopefully helps you to grow a bigger business, is um, that writing the the documentation for uh, to convince investors to invest, so uh, uh, an investor presentation uh, or deck, as it's sometimes known, um, does force some really crisp thinking about exactly what your plan or your strategy is i think that's actually a useful exercise and and it can be quite an enjoyable thing to do uh, as well although it is hard particularly if you're new to it but no the rest of the process of raising money is 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 tedious and most people don't enjoy doing it Mm, it's about uh, having a thick skin by the end of the process, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and what sort of experience uh, should people actually expect when when they're raising money? Because I think that's one of the big thing about this masterclass is you sharing your knowledge as well, so that people are a bit more prepared when going into those things. Yeah, I think um, very often founders underestimate how long it will take to raise money. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there are some debt products uh, which um, can be a bit faster. Uh, and, and in fact, if you already have a, a stable um, business that's throwing off cash or has good revenues, uh, then you might well be able to get, including actually, as it happens, I'm not here to plug it, but the debt that's available through Tide is pretty rapid. But the whole of the rest of the market is unfortunately um, pretty painful. And if you're if you're looking to sell shares, so the issue equity as it's known, then um, uh, that'll typically be something between three and nine months um, uh, from the start of your pitching process all the way through to the money arriving in the bank. It takes that long because just lining up the meetings uh, takes quite a long time. And then even when people have agreed to invest, um, there's then a, a stage of, uh, they, they call it due diligence. It's sort of asking more detailed questions to check that what you said in the process was true. Uh, and then um, after that, uh, you get into the legals uh, and agreeing all the contract stuff. And altogether, very rare that you get all this done in less than three months. And when you're dealing with big institutions getting in to invest, it could well be that it's taken you, um, you know, as long as nine months uh, until the money is in the bank from uh, the point of the first pitches. So um, it does take a very long time and it's a big distraction for founders. Uh, and of course, uh, you sort of have to reply to all of these investors' queries within a day or two because uh, you need to keep them warm and interested and convinced that you're a fast-moving organization. Um, so uh, it, it takes up a lot of your, your time and it's a big distraction. Um, typically, find that uh, whereas you will get back to investors very quickly, um, they do not feel under any pressure to do the same for you. They can be very slow to respond. They quite often just don't respond at all. Uh, that is not um, unknown. And uh, sometimes um, it's worth understanding their incentives. Uh, their incentive actually usually is not to say no to a business that they don't currently want to invest in. Because what happens if next week something in that business changes and suddenly it turns into an amazing investment? So instead, they'll just sort of string you along, um, uh, waiting to see if between today and the point at which the, the, the investment round closes, things uh, improve, uh, because if they do hear that things have improved, then of course they'll, they'll want to um, uh, come back in. So they won't give you a clear answer a load of the time. And the final thing to, to know is that the materials you give them, uh, certainly before they sign what's called a term sheet, which is a non-binding commitment to, to invest subject to all the due diligence and legals. Um, the documents you give them before that is very high risk that those documents will be shared around other investors in the community, even when investors promise you they won't do it. Uh, sadly, not all of them, maybe not even most of them, but a lot of them uh, do share materials around. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, 
the truth is that probably actually won't impact your business in any significant way, but it is extremely annoying. Uh, so yeah, that's quite common. I should mention, by the way, um, in case we don't cover it anywhere else, that there's often some confusion about what documents you should prepare for investors. Um, and although it is true that there are a very small number of investors that want a sort of lengthy Word document with a detailed plan that feels like a plan, um, uh, if you're selling shares, issuing equity, particularly at early stages, really anything more than a 10 slide PowerPoint is, is very likely to be too long and too much uh, and investors won't pay much attention. And if you then turn up with a 50 page Word document, you sort of look like a bit of a weirdo. So uh, better, better not to do that. Right. We've, yeah, and, and you've, um, thank you for sharing all those tips, George. Um, and, uh, you know, we've talked about, well, you've talked about how, you know, how incredibly lengthy process it is, the rejection, the back and forth, the, the, there is a lot of waiting uh, in the whole process, which uh, I'm, I'm sure um, must be very stressful at, at different points, um, especially as you were saying, as a funder, you've got so many other things to worry about, like running the business as well as, as raising money. Um, so, um, you know, basically it sounds really tough. Um, so is, is, is the whole process worth it? Um, you know, what's, what are the benefits? So um, if you have the option not to do it, then you should almost always not do it. Uh, but lots of businesses don't, don't have the option because um, growing is, is going to require some upfront expenditure and they don't have the cash to do it any other way. So they have to go and raise money. And, and that's, you know, if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Um, but there are there are real downsides to it as well as the upsides. Um, the downsides are uh, the, the loss of ownership and control is, is greater than you would think. And what I mean by that is even if you only ever gave away 10%, which is rare, by the way, normally if you're giving away selling shares, you'll, you'll end up at the end of the journey, maybe owning 10%. Or, um, uh, but um, uh, if, if you, even if you only ever let, let other people have 10% and you had 90%, still everyone involved in that company knows that you no longer control it. Uh, and you're no longer the, the final say. All the staff know it, uh, the board know it, obviously the investors know it, et cetera, et cetera, any partners you work with. Uh, so there is a loss of authority that comes with that. I think it's not uh, widely understood. Um, a very annoying thing that can happen after you've done um, a couple of these rounds is, well, in every round, uh, investors will insist that your share ownership as a founder be related to you continuing to work for a few more years and they, uh, that you have what's called a vesting uh, process where your shares uh, vest um, over typically four years, but it can be different numbers. Um, and then you might think by the time you got to year four, brilliant, I now own all my shares 100%. But then in the next investment round, they'll say, well, we're not giving you any more shares. And the shares you've already got, you've now got to change the terms on those and work for another however many years um, uh, before you own those. And that can lead to the scenario where founders work for many, many years and then they stop uh, running the company. And actually it turns out that they've only got, you know, a quarter of the shares that they, they thought they were going to have um, uh, because of this, this reset on vesting. You can negotiate that away, but you need to be aware that it's a risk. Um, and the truth is you, then you've taken in investors' money and, and that means you've, you're potentially stuck with one or several um, investors on your board and uh, you know they're not always the best behaved people in the world so that can be a bit irritating however you know if you need the money you need the money and uh, the money itself can be transformative to what you can do with your business that may still be worth it but you do need to be aware of the of the downsides too right and so exactly you've mentioned business growth and depending on the type of growth you want to achieve it, it comes to a point where you have to to take on that kind of investment so we'd love to hear from you uh, about this uh, i'm launching a poll uh, right now you should see it on your screen uh, the question is is your intention to build a big business this would be very helpful okay for at the moment we've got 90% of you are saying yes, 10% no. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you 30 more seconds, but it, you should have the poll on your screen. If you could, if you could let us know, it, it'd be fantastic to know. Great, because then, George, I think you can comment on this, right? Whether or not you want to build a big business and how important um, 
that's that's going to be as well in the in the decision making of what kind of investment and funding you take on. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, if your intention is to build a big business, then um, that makes it much more doable to go and raise uh, money from third parties. And if if your intention is not to build a big business, um, I mean, crudely put, and of course there are exceptions to this, but um, you're very unlikely to be able to uh, raise um, money by selling shares if your uh, investors don't have reason to believe they're going to get, well, certainly in the early days of a business, 50 times their money back, uh, or potentially in, in the good scenario. Um, and that's not going to be the case unless you are uh, building a big, or have a storyline for why you're trying to build a big business. Um, if you know you're building a small business, then um, uh, in some ways that makes things more straightforward because uh, selling shares is actually quite unlikely to be uh, the, the the solution for you. Rather, you're going to need to find forms of debt uh, or indeed go and um, I, I strongly recommend, um, uh, particularly for early stage businesses, if you haven't got the cash in, in the company and it doesn't need very much cash, then going getting a regular job, operating as a, a contractor, uh, getting the revenue from that contracting work straight into your company and um, and then uh, using that before it hits any sort of income tax, because you're not actually paying it to yourself as an individual, uh, using that money to, to fund your, your business, uh, possibly with a, an inexpensive junior employee actually doing a lot of the work for you, um, uh, is, is a very efficient and stable way to, um, uh, to fund your business in, in the early days. And talking about different ways to fund your business uh, early days, you also have um, raised money from friends and family. And this is a very particular way of raising money. And obviously, emotionally, it's on a whole different level. So how, how did that feel? And what's been your experience with raising funds with family and friends? Yeah, I think um, uh, generally, I'd, I advise people to avoid raising money from friends and family. So when I had my retail e-commerce business that failed, I had taken tens of thousands of pounds from friends and family and they lost it. And um, I, actually a decade later, I paid some of them back. Uh, so that that helped uh, with the relationships and it made me feel less guilty. But uh, one of two things will happen if you lose friends and family money. Um, maybe uh, they will be annoyed with you and that's bad. But almost certainly, unless you're a psychopath, you will feel very guilty about it. Uh, and because failure is the default outcome for early stage businesses, that means the default is that you are going to feel awful about losing your friends and family's money. Um, so if you can avoid it, uh, I, I really recommend avoiding it. Um, of course, there are scenarios where friends and family do very well after these deals. And I'll give you an example, which is Tide. So Tide had raised a regular... Uh, selling shares round um, with, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think initially we'd taken 150,000, which was the maximum we could do under the government SEIS tax scheme that some people on this call will know about, but I won't go through the details. And we had spent it, and actually things hadn't gone very well. Uh, we had sort of started building a product, but then the guy who was um, leading the technology side uh, left the company and ran off for the code. Uh, so we had no product, uh, no money left. Uh, we had essentially, you know, wasted the money we we'd been given and therefore uh, nobody sensible would give us any more money. Um, and uh, we were desperate, uh, sufficiently desperate that over Christmas, um, I had to do the thing I didn't want to do, which was to ask a couple of friends, uh, some quite wealthy uh, private equity friends, uh, if they would uh, essentially bail us out. Um, I obviously didn't tell them that we were looking like a walking corpse, but the truth is that at the time that really was the status of the company. Um, and they did uh, put money in. And of course, they've done incredibly well out of out of that uh, since. Um, so, you know, there are circumstances in which friends and family um, is the right thing to do. But uh, in the main, I, I recommend against it. Right. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, I can see a lot of questions coming up. Thank you so much. If you could use the Q&A box um, to, to ask all the questions, that, that, that'd be uh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, George, like, we've, we've, we've talked about this, but you've done this for quite a while now with loads of different parties. Um, what have been the most um, memorable moments you've experienced when when raising money? 
Yeah. Um, the main experience of the months in which you raise money, is, it just feels like a lot of waiting. Um, obviously, you know, you're a busy founder. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of high energy form of waiting. But you know, I remember just spending a huge amount of time in, in, in tubes and taxis going off to meetings and, and waiting in, in reception and lob- the reception lobby of uh, venture capital funds and so forth. And I guess cafes to meet angels, um, a huge proportion of whom, by the way, don't respect your time and uh, turn up late to meetings. And you, you get very used to that. Um, and lots of uh, venture capitalists um, just only barely paying attention in meetings, checking their phones, doing emails, stepping out of the meetings to take calls, et cetera. Um, that, that is unfortunately the mainstay of the process and you just have to sort of keep bashing through it. Um, and then you have the sort of dramatic uh, um, low points like uh, actually with a venture capitalist who did in the end invest, but I and uh, Tied COO at the time flew out to Stockholm to do the final stage of convincing uh, the whole investment committee of a big um, Swedish venture capitalist fund that they should invest in us. And during the pitch, the one hour pitch in front of all sort of 15 of them, um, uh, we were demoing our product and it just didn't work like that. And it turned out somebody back in London had changed a thing on a server without telling anyone. And the product was fine for the Tide members, but for the public. But we had a special demo thing, demo version, which was supposed to be the most stable uh, for <laughs> these purposes, which had been um, which had been trashed. And so the demo just died. And, and you know, it was one of the most crushing moments of uh, of my life. Um, uh, a full meeting. Yes, I'm somehow in the end we rescued it by uh, sending them a video that night of of uh, what they should have seen during the day, and they were impressed that we had sort of bothered to fight on. Um, so we still got the investment, but yeah, it happened and it was it was painful. Um, I remember another time with an angel where I I, I turned up to a meeting in a coffee shop um, and I just literally forgotten to bring printouts of the of the presentation. So we had nothing to discuss. I looked like a total idiot. So, um, you know, these, <laughs> these things do happen. Uh, but on the upside, when you have a, a good day and a good pitch, um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly energizing. Uh, when you walk out and you know you smashed it, um, but it's it's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, it's when you forget the presentation that uh, you remember to bring it to the next meeting, right? And when the demo fails that, you remember to maybe have a backup video recording of the demo to show. So great, great learnings in the end, but quite painful, painful in the moment. Um, you've uh, you've mentioned, uh, you know, VCs and, 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 and some of the stuff that have happened. Um, you've been pretty vocal uh, online about your experience with the uh, investors. Uh, which are, hasn't always been positive. Um, yeah, can, can you tell us more about this? Yeah, sure. Um, it's not always been negative either. Uh, so I, actually, I would say with most of the angel investors I've dealt with, it's been very positive in particular. Um, the key thing to know about angels who, for anyone who doesn't know this on, on this uh, call, um, angels are just rich individuals um, who will write a check to support your business. And... Um, if they are experienced business angels, they understand that that they really aren't going to have any power in your company uh, and they shouldn't try and exercise any. And um, they also should understand that, you know, that they're going to write a lot of checks for a lot of businesses. They should have a diversified portfolio and nine out of 10 of those, they're not going to get their money back or they're certainly not going to get a positive return on the money beyond getting it back. Um, so they should be expecting that. And at the point that they they wire the money across, psychologically, they should have basically written it off. And then um, when if they make a profit, that's sort of upside. Um, and and by the way, when they do make profits, the profits are enormous. So it, 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 it all works out for them. You should never feel guilty about the fact that your company is potentially one of the nine out of 10 that they don't make money on, because if they make money on the one out of 10, they're, they're going to do brilliantly. Um, so long as angels have that sort of humility of recognizing that they are not uh, going to determine the future of your organization, uh, they can be um, you know, very pleasant to deal with. Uh, um, I would say that it's with VCs, things are a little bit different because you do have to remember what their their incentives are. So uh, although when you're initially building a relationship with them, um, they they will talk a lot about how they're very, very founder friendly. The reality is 
uh, they've got lots of other stakeholders to feed. It's different from taking money from a rich individual who just has to, you know, get over uh, losing their own money, and that's fine. If you take money from a venture capital fund, um, there'll be other uh, partners in that fund who will look badly on the VC if the VC's uh, investments have, have gone bad. Um, as the people who invested in the fund, uh, who are called limited partners, they will, um, uh, uh, they're not going to like it if, if the investments go bad. Um, the rest of the other colleagues in the fund feel a bit stupid around if, if your investments go bad. And um, and they've got other sort of stakeholders that they're considering like uh, external to the fund, like uh, the other CEOs of other companies that they've uh, invested in, they might want to um, build relationships with, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, because of all of that, they have lots of people to uh, consider how they keep happy, aside from you as the as the founder who's pitching them or is taking their money, and that means that you are, you know may well see uh, behaviours out of them that are not aligned with the interests of your company, and that's that's just a you know it, it's an unfortunate fact. Um, but uh, you know, the classy ones um, will work out a way to keep all of those stakeholders, including you, uh, kind of comfortable and happy over the journey um, and try and manage the, the competing interests there. Um, but it's not easy. It's made uh, easier if investors have got experience running companies themselves. They understand a bit more about what, what matters. Um, but a lot of uh, VCs don't. I mean, in the States, it's very common for VCs to have experience working in or running companies. In Europe, uh, many more of them um, come from investment banking. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is not famously a massively high empathy community so um uh you know it's yeah VC, there are good reasons why why vcs have better reputations but you can find you can find nice ones right and it's about those meeting and building those relationship right and i think um um one of the questions we had was it, should i um accept any type of uh investments that i'm being offered so maybe we'll, we'll get to that a bit later on about the different types of relationships and what you're looking for in in those investors but um um what we've talked about was mainly either before or during the fundraising process um can you tell us a bit more about what the relationship with investors is like um after they have invested yeah i mean um ideally it should be a pretty silent relationship. Um, it, my experience is that it is true that investors can add value to your company, but they will usually do it on a very tiny number of occasions. There might be one or two ways in which a given investor can add value with a particular relationship that they've got or a particular idea that they have. Um, but likely all of those benefits will be sort of exhausted in, in the first couple of weeks. Uh, it might be that later on they can introduce you to other investors when you're taking uh, investment in further rounds, and that is useful. But the rest of the time, most founders would prefer their investors basically just to sort of not call them. Um, I had one uh, investor in my retail e-commerce business who I noticed used to keep um, phoning me every Friday afternoon, unscheduled at three o'clock in the afternoon. And after he'd been doing this for a few weeks, I asked him why it was that he would do this. And he told me it was because usually by that point in the week, he'd finished his work and he was a bit bored. Uh, now, I, I don't think so that to be terribly useful for founders. So in the main, most founders would, would prefer not to have a huge amount of contact from, from their investors. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, some of them can be very supportive. Uh, some of them are unsupportive and, and can be quite undermining if they want to. They definitely have, uh, at least institutional investors, um, have the power to uh, undermine uh, companies, not least because if you need further investment at further stages, those investors, the existing investors, uh, need to be seen to be still supporters of, of how the company is operating. Um, the way to re re reduce those risks is uh, before you take an investor's money is to get in touch with the companies that they previously invested in, the founders or the CEOs of those companies, without telling the investor that you're doing it. That's very, very important. Um, and then and privately and secretly get feedback on what those investors are really like. Worth noting that um, if a portfolio CEO um, gives you anything other than a glowing review about an investor, then it is a negative review. They may not be willing to be completely open with a stranger about why they despise a particular investor, but if they, uh, you can be sure if they like the investor, they will tell you. So if they're not telling you, it means they don't like them. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing all this 
very very helpful uh, insights and 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 tips and a bit more about insights um so the question just before we we go on to the q a we have a couple of questions before we move on to the q a and by the way i can see a great number of questions already but do keep on adding them. I hope we can get around to as many of them as possible. But um, yeah, before we, we wrap up with one final question, um, what have you learned, George, about uh, raising money along the way of, uh, of all this experience? So um, in particular, I'd emphasize the importance of competitive pressure. Mm. You have to do everything possible to try and have two different investors competing against each other if you want to get the terms that are good for the business. If you haven't got two investors, it's just so much harder to get terms out of the, the process that are good. So absolutely do not rely on one investor or, or one pitch or whatever. Um, you need to be running a process, you know, kissing a lot of frogs in the hope that ultimately two of them will, will, will start competing with each other. Um, the uh, Unless there is competitive pressure, Investors don't have an incentive to, to move quickly. And in fact, the opposite is true. As I mentioned before, their incentive is to wait and see how your company's doing and string you along. So um, the best way around that, if you haven't yet got competitive pressure, is to early on in the process, ask the investors to name their own deadlines. So to say, how quickly can you make a decision? What are the stages before that? Yada, yada, yada. And if they tell you, you know, you, you do one more meeting uh, and then they'll ask for a couple of documents and the the next meeting will be maybe in a week's time and the documents will be in two weeks and so they're saying you know by the end of the month um they can make a decision you know remind them of that and and that, that's probably about as much power as you've got uh in the absence of competitive pressure to just hurry them along um but if you do have competitive pressure or just if your business is going amazingly and so uh it's obvious that if you were to talk to lots of investors you would have competitive pressure then um you can get anything you want out of uh out of the terms uh lots of um the legal terms that enter into company documents uh, as part of this process are actually more negotiable than is normally understood i've heard amazing stories about great entrepreneurs who've been able to convince uh experienced investors not to uh, have standard terms because the entrepreneurs uh, were so credible that they could uh, essentially argue for whatever terms they wanted. So it is possible if you've got a strong hand. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, George, for sharing all those fantastic, brilliant tips uh, of your experience and for sharing it with us today. Um, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, just like always, we love our or any content we share with our members or small business owners in general to be very actionable knowledge and uh, you know action driven. So, what would be the main thing for people with us in this masterclass or later on on YouTube um, to to take away? What are the the three things to ensure uh, they do to be investor ready? Um, so, for three things, I would say firstly. Um, it's very important to deeply understand your unit economics. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. The second is to have a really great um, and great looking presentation for investors. And the third is to have a large um, number in mind that you can tell the investors you're going to hit a large potential future valuation and a reason for why you're going to get to that. So let me talk about those three things in turn. Um, savvy investors know that usually the most important thing in a business is the ratio between uh, what it takes you to get your next customer and how much profit you expect to make on that, uh, on that customer over the lifetime of having a relationship with that customer. So um, the reason why my terrible retail e-commerce business was a terrible business is it would cost us, um, you know, 10 or 15 pounds to, recruit the customer mainly by doing paid advertising and then we'd only make 15 to 20 pounds in margin on that customer and that's that's just a terrible business so um uh, really, you want a business where you can show that uh, you expect over the lifetime of a customer to make a variable margin, or as it's known, a gross margin of uh, three times whatever it costs to win that customer in the first place. Um, smart investors will love 
the fact that you uh, can tell that story. Um, by the way, you don't need to have proven that story, certainly not in the early days. You just need to have uh, data to indicate that it is hopefully ach achievable in the medium to long term. Um, the second point I mentioned is having a good looking presentation. So investors look at an awful lot of presentations and it does matter that your uh, presentation appears highly professional and well put together. Uh, it really is worth paying a few hundred quid um, to a graphic designer to make it look beautiful. It, I, it feels like it shouldn't. It feels like investors should only care about um, uh, you know the, the ideas in in the presentation but the truth is uh, they are influenced by the professionalism that is communicated by the look and feel so it, it really is worth doing that you can get uh, designers on upwork.com some people would know is a, a freelancer website and there are um, other websites for this purpose if you if you google um, the final thing i would say and i've seen um, entrepreneurs make this mistake a lot of time is uh, if you've got a presentation that shows that in five years time, you hope to have revenues of uh, seven million pounds, for example, um, and you are currently trying to raise money at a one to two million pound valuation, you haven't told your audience that you will ever be a business that has got revenues of 50 million pounds. Uh, and so the investor just doesn't know that this will ever be a big business. Uh, it is really important to have a point of view on um, how you could ever be a big business with a big number, because um, that is what the least equity investors are going to be looking for. Debt, uh, debt lenders is different. They just need to know that they're going to get paid back with a high level of confidence. They don't give a monkeys about how big you want to be. But if you are selling shares, make sure you've got a big number. Don't worry too much about how many years in the future it is. Yeah. It can be, you know, eight, nine, 10 years out, but there needs to be a big number somewhere in, in, in the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, George. Thank you so much for sharing all these fantastic tips. Um, I can see there is a, a big number of questions. So let's let let's get um let's get to the QA. Just as well, I'm just going to uh, share a poll. You'll have it on your screen. Uh, take it whenever you have a second, just to let us know about this masterclass, five being the highest number, uh, a great, a great event. Um, and if you have any feedback for us around, you know, what um, topics you want us to um, um, cover in the future, please let us know as well. Fantastic. So uh, let's get around to the questions. We've got eight so far in the Q&A uh, box. Um, George, I don't know if there is any in particular that you want to start taking first. Um, why I, I tell you, why don't I just rattle through um, uh, the ones that I can see, um, and I'll try and get through a number of them in a go, and then you can ask me about uh, anything. Yeah, because I, I think there is one that's very interesting, maybe, which is, uh, George, can you explain the risk of not raising enough money? I don't know if you can see this one. Yes, um, I have seen that. So the risks of raising, uh, not raising enough money, well, I... I the first point is you will almost certainly not raise enough money. So um, if you are in Silicon Valley and you've got a very hot startup, yes, it is true that you might somehow achieve the extraordinary scenario of raising more money than you need. Uh, and, and very occasionally that is, is the case. Um, but if you're in Europe um, or indeed anywhere that's not Silicon Valley, pretty much, um, the likelihood of that taking place is, is low. Um, so... Uh, Given that it's nearly a certainty that you are going to raise less money than you are, you know, you would ideally have raised. Uh, the question is, how do you sort of think about that? And the answer is, you you can only raise the amount that you can raise. You should, in almost all circumstances, ignore the VC's advice to only raise what you need, because the truth is, what you need is probably more than you're going to get. You don't realize that this year, by the way. So you realize that after you spent more than money than you intended to in 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 a twelve or twenty four months time, but um, it's probably the case that the maximum you can raise is is the is the optimum amount to raise at the current uh, stage, and you just work backwards from from that. So, um, if you think by having informal conversation with investors that a company at the stage you're at can raise half a million pounds, then just bank that and do the best with it. Um, but have a uh, have a really tight lens on what the milestones are that you need to be seen to hit before you then raise money again after that um and it's a sad fact that 
your strategy, so long as you're not profitable, your strategy probably does have to work backwards from what you need to prove to future investors in the future to get them to give you more money at that point. Uh, and that's how you prioritize what things you're going to do in the next few months. So, um, yeah, the risks of, of not really, you're not going to raise enough money. So, so uh, you can't do anything about those risks. Just raise as much as you can. Great. Thank you so much. Do you do you want to take any? I'll just rattle through some of the others. Yeah, yeah let me let me do that. So, um, uh, Shamin asks, uh, um, I would be grateful if George can give some information about how to raise funds without giving away the equity. Um, I, if you want to give away zero equity, then you're going to have to take debt. Uh, I'm not aware of any other way to do that unless you can win some sort of government grants or whatever, which is very, very rare. Um, although worth Googling, like it is worth spending an hour on Google to see if there are government grants available for you, but there probably won't be for most businesses. Um, then uh, um, debt, um, you know, there are different forms of debt. You probably won't get venture debt, particularly if you're an early stage company, you need to be quite big and already be backed by venture capitalists. Um, but you might be able to get bank debt if you are, um, uh, uh, you know, reasonably stable. Um, there are debt products in in Tide actually if you're a Tide member uh, for some types of uh, companies. Um, but you know, debt, debt can be tricky to 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 get, and and that's just what it is. And you may well need to think about um, your willingness to either take personal liability by using credit cards and personal loans, or take business loans with a personal guarantee. And that that's a decision that you're going to need to make for yourself based on your own uh, opinion of um, your ability to service the debt and to cope if the business goes down. Um, if you just want to minimize the amount of, of uh, equity you give away, but uh, but still give away some, then you need that competitive pressure between investors that I discussed before. Uh, the next question um, from Shamin Pathan is, does Tide invest in startup companies? Um, uh, not uh, by buying shares. Um, uh, there are it is possible to be a reasonably young company and um, get debt from Tide under some circumstances. Um, uh, and there'd be some information about that on the web, but um, uh, but Tide is not an equity investor. And just on this, George, sorry, uh, no. I've just shared on the, the chat our link to the different credit options that they are available um, with, with Tide, depending on, you know, your business and, 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 and lots of different um, things, but also I've um, I've shared the credit builder tool. So have a look. We've got loads of different options for different businesses, depending on, on the business types that you are running. Um, yeah. And also just to say, our next masterclass of the series, which is Tuesday, is going to be about startup loans um, and, you know, uh, debt funding. So if you want to be joining that as well, that's on, on Tuesday. Um, uh, by the way, I noticed there's a, a question related to that actually in the chat. Somebody says, um, I imagine Tide has a high number of business owners who've experienced financial difficulties and therefore have a core credit rating. How do I advise that they overcome the gut feeling of embarrassment when showing all during the process of borrowing it, raising investment? Um, so uh, it's not unknown for founders to have fairly shaky credit ratings. So don't be, I mean, <laughs> actually, even some of the most successful founders at different points in their journey have had fairly shaky credit history. So um, uh you know, just got to be bigger than 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 that, and not worry too much about the embarrassment of it. So, you know, you'll have to make lots, of, do lots of tough things in running your company over the years, and and suffering a bit of embarrassment and admitting the fact that you missed a couple of payments on your gas three years ago is 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 relatively low on the list of of pains you're going to endure. So um, uh, it's probably not. Uh, you know, much you can you can do about that. But I mean, what's the worst they can do? And the answer is the worst they can do is say no, and and that's all. So nothing bad's going to happen. Um, Somebody asked, would you recommend applying for grants? Uh, and I would say, uh, as I said, yeah, it's worth Googling, see if there are any, if they exist. You know, don't rely on getting the grant. You probably won't get it, but you can make your own decision about whether or not you've got a chance and if you can, if it's worth the time spent uh, applying. Um, other organizations uh, in general that uh, you would recommend approaching for funding? Um, it depends a lot on the stage that your organization is at um, and 
probably the best thing actually to do again on that is googling i can't tell you one great list or resource to go to to to, to find uh, organizations um uh pratik asks how do i assess uh, whether or not my company would be my business idea would be profitable um that i would focus on the thing i talked about before which is the relationship between your likely cost of uh customer acquisition and the amount of profit you expect to make per customer in the future and you answer that question with a spreadsheet uh, and some reasonable assumptions ben asks is it important to have e seis and eis beforehand that's a tax scheme which protects uh angel investors individuals and um the answer is yes if your company could be eligible for that and you want money from angels you pretty much must have it and angels will almost always unless they don't know what they're doing uh insist that you have it before they're willing to to invest um val how much longer do we have to answer so, i think i think we might have a minute i actually <laughs> i actually don't know if this is going to kick us out i've never finished a master class i've never run run over but if you still have a minute maybe we can try it okay that's uh, good I'm, I'm just i just want to say to dorian uh, i will send the recording there is, there is going to be an email from zoom um in a couple of days and that will include a recording of the youtube video and then we'll share it on the blog so you'll have you'll have all the information there um but maybe we can take um anna's question how do you calculate customer acquisition cost versus return for customer if you want to take this one uh george sure um it will depend a lot, uh, and just to repeat the question, it's how do you calculate customer acquisition cost versus return from the customer? So customer acquisition cost depends a lot on the advertising channel, marketing channel you're using to get to it. If you're buying Facebook ads, then you'll know it's gonna cost you five pounds or 50 pounds or 500 pounds per um, uh, customer that you win to acquire that customer. That's a bit easier to calculate than some other approaches, like if you're sending salespeople door to door, and then you'd have to divide the, uh, um, uh, the salary of the salesperson by the number of sales they get. And that tells you your cost of, of customer acquisition, but it will vary a bit by channel. Now you might think, well, I'm very early on in my business. How on earth can I work out what these channels that I've never operated in will cost? And the answer is, talk to people who are already uh, operating in those channels and just do the best estimate that you can get to. Um, then on what the returns you're going to make, uh, the key thing is, is the variable return. So it's not about the um, the overhead costs you've got, uh, like, you know, your, your staff uh, desks and office space and so on. Um, it's just about uh, the um, the revenue per customer you're going to make, uh, which obviously is completely dependent on what it is that you sell uh, and how many um, uh, units of it over the lifetime um, that your customer is with you that they will buy um, and what price you charge for that, minus the variable costs of uh, actually selling that particular unit to that particular customer. Great, thank you. Should we take the last one? A, 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 a... Uh, just a one last question, if if that's all right. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm going to. Edward has asked a very um, complex one. If you'll forgive me, so Edward says he started his business just under a year ago with five thousand of personal savings, generated six figures or more than six figures of revenue, and profitable. Yet still can't get any funding. Any alternative options to get financing quickly? Not a fan of giving up equity. So first of all, um, Edward, congratulations. That is a non-trivial achievement, and I hope you feel very proud of getting a business to that uh, to that level. Um, uh, so um, there are not. There's not like an obvious easy answer. If you haven't already, yeah, it's worth Googling the different debt options that are out there and probably just doing a load of phone calls. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to uh, spend an afternoon talking to different debt brokers um, who know all the different lenders that might be available. If you don't want to give up equity, then lending is almost certainly your only option unless you are eligible for some sort of grant. Um, so, I mean, of course, we should mention the, the debt options from Tide, but if they're not available for whatever reason, then uh, debt brokers um, are likely to be or credit brokers for business are likely to be your, your best option. Great. Thank you so much, George. And just to remind everyone, I've put in the chat the links to our different credit options. I, I, I believe there is a few of you sharing other programs from different cities as well. So if you if you want to check that out, um, 
you know, it's in the chat. I've put all the links. I've also put the link to Kendu's website, uh, the company uh, George funded after Tide, and also all the links to our uh, different events page to, to keep in touch. We'll host this, the episode two of our masterclass on Tuesday. So, you know, um, you can register through our, our events uh, website. Um, but um, thank you so, so much. We actually ran over and an incredible number of you are still live in this, uh, in this masterclass. So thank you so, so much. Um, and, uh, oh, okay. Thank you so much for your feedback. I'm reading this masterclass is extremely helpful. One hour is not enough. Can you make the next session an hour and a half, please? Probably give us an option to send the related question beforehand will be very helpful. Well, thank you so much for that feedback. That's very helpful for me. Um, and thank you again so much, uh, George, for you know sharing all your knowledge. I'm seeing other tremendous feedback um, uh, in, in the chat. Super, super summary, George says Amanda. So thank you again so, so much for sharing all your knowledge, George. Um, thank you for taking the time. And thank you to all of you watching us live, really. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, everyone. It's been really, really fun to, to talk all this through. And good luck this year. It's going to be tough the next 12 months, but good luck in your businesses. You can get through it. Fantastic. Thank you so much.